Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by middleweight contender, the great Teddy Atlas, looking svelte as ever. How you doing, Teddy? Getting there, getting there. 18 pounds today. I hit the tip the scales, as we say in the business. At, <laughs> uh, minus 18 pounds and counting. So getting there, getting there. Thank you for Look asking. Good. And um, did the fight plan. I want the people to be looking forward to that, hopefully. We did the fight plan Thursday at um, Trinity Boxing Club, a very hot Trinity Boxing <laughs> Club in Manhattan. Uh, probably the t temperature was probably around 93 degrees that day. It was probably about 110 in the, in the gym. <laughs> but well, we, we sweat for you guys. We want you to know that, to our fans. We sweat for you. And... Um, yep. We we put it together the Triple G, uh, third fight coming up with Canelo and of course the Usyk rematch coming up with Joshua, so that will be ready. Hopefully, you guys will uh, be chomping at the bid to see it, and we'll uh, we'll appreciate it, we'll like it, and it will help you with your handicapping skills and and just your overall viewing pleasure of of the fight of what to look for yeah any fighters coming to new york city ufc mma boxing needing to cut weight especially in the summer i highly recommend the trinity boxing club in downtown manhattan you don't even need a sauna you'll get two in one for going there and it's an old school place with probably one of the biggest legends in uh, amongst gym owners in the world the great martin snow uh, excellent facility but um short on accoutrements shall we say <laughs> this yeah, is a bare bones Rocky style gym. Yeah, just what you need, and it's uh, it's great. You get great characters coming in and out of there, New York characters and people. And uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, he I think he had Steven Spielberg's son there, right? He he was that's right. He was yep. there that he was day. Training while we were he there, was yeah. training. We met him. It was nice kid. And then uh, and then John Duddy, uh, the tremendous oh, the Irish legend. fighter. Uh, that that's also an actor and doing other things. He, he's training some fighters. Good person, good overall person. He was there. It was great to see and him. And the legend Peter Quillen. Yeah, Peter K Quillen. Um, Kid Chocolate. A lot of the yeah. fight fans will remember him as uh, junior middleweight. He he had a junior middleweight title. Then he lost to um, Danny Jacobs, uh, yep. another New Yorker, uh, at the Garden. I believe that fight was. I think I think it was the Garden. It was either there or Barclays Center. But um, yep. yeah, we we had a good good people there with us, uh, watching as we did it, and they were they're such gentlemen because obviously we need them to to not be working out while we're doing what we're doing, and they all accommodate us. They go outside. Uh, and then this day was even more difficult because there was a thunderstorm going on. So, yeah, we really appreciate our. We always appreciate good people, and we appreciate the good people down at Trinity. Yeah, thunderstorm would be an understatement. Torrential downpour slash tsunami was more like it. But uh, like you said, we made it happen. And uh, yeah, always legends floating around in Trinity. It's crazy to think people walking by, if had they popped in and a few did, to see Teddy Atlas, Peter Quill, and John Duddy all working out in the same gym or working together in the same gym. It was, uh, I don't know, that stuff's never lost on me when I'm there. I always kind of look at Rob like, can you believe we're doing this? This is unbelievable. So much fun. So great to be around such uh, boxing luminaries and more than anything, good people. It was just a collection 100%. of really good quality people. 100%. Any, before, what, what's the name of the, the writer that was there too? He's a terrific person too. Um, he, oh, my friend Ben yeah, Anderson yeah, from tremendous. Vice News stopped by. Does He's some serious stuff the uh, out there in yeah. the in the writing world, um, reporting world, yeah. Yeah, war correspondent from Vice News, not with Vice anymore, he's working on some do freelance documentaries, but he's a legend in war correspondent and doing documentaries about the conflicts, especially in the Middle East. But yeah, always good to see all of our friends there. And uh, before we get started, let me give a quick shout out to our one of our sponsors, Feel Free Botanic Tonics. This is a kava-based um, drink that 
creates like a euphoric relaxation feeling, at least for me. I take it before we record the show, helps me focus, calms me down. I get all hyped up talking about fighting. But check them out at botanictonics.com. Use the promo code ATLAS to save 40% off your first purchase. I buy this stuff by the box, by several boxes at a time. They don't give it to me for free. I actually buy it. Uh, check them out, botanictonics.com. Promo code ATLAS and get yourself a box of feel free. But uh, Teddy, good card from London. Before you get into that, before you get into that, I have to segue from your promotion there to um, from feeling good um, to where you're going to need probably a couple quarts of that after your Red Sox showing uh, last this past weekend when they got 28, I, I still can't believe <laughs> I'm saying this number, 28 runs put up on them. Against Four touchdowns. The, uh, really? I thought it was a Patriot game. I, I thought it was like watching. A, when I saw the score, I said, that's the Patriots. They must they must have started summer football or something. Um, yeah. You know, 28 runs uh, given up by them against Toronto. Uh, it, it's just, it hasn't been good since you left there. I mean, no, the, mo- since you went to run, Tennessee. Most runs ever. <laughs> most runs ever by the Red Sox given up. Humiliating, embarrassing. But as you know, I'll live and die with them. I'll go down with the ship. They're my guys, good or bad. But geez, guys, have some pride. Get your shit together. This is unacceptable. 28 runs? Seriously, we could have, I could come in and pitch and give up less than 28 runs. Come on, man. The, the fielding, everything was terrible. But you know, Sorry to take you out of your nice karma that you were in. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get back to it because you... I'm going to have to have an extra... I'm going to have an extra serving of uh, feel free. <laughs> Anywho, um, back to the UFC. Dave Portnoy steals the show. <laughs> Did you see Molly McCann and Patty Pimblett jump into his arms? I mean, he must have been he must have been working with the UFC because he was such a featured part of the show. They mentioned him on the broadcast, and you know, if they don't like you, they don't even mention your name on the broadcast there. The UFC brass, that is. But uh, yeah, Dave was sitting ringside. Molly McCann, Patty Pimblett, obviously big wins. M- P- Molly McCann jumps into his arms. I <laughs> I had to do a double take. I'm like, oh my god, is that Portnoy jumping around with with tails? I and love a top Paul, coat, I lo- yeah, but a tails and a top hat. <laughs> Yeah, but I I like him better without the wig though, you know, because <laughs> because when because when Patty fought he, he adapted to the wig to you know the blonde yeah, wig yeah and, yeah and I like him better without. But listen, he's a brilliant talking about Portnoy. He's a brilliant businessman and he's got a good eye for for stars. You know, yeah. he, he really does. Let's be honest. Uh, look what he did building up Barstool Sports. So, you know, he, he understands what's coming. He understands what's, you know, what people are going to be into. And um, he understood these two guys of, of you know, budding stars. And uh, he, he did a deal with them. He's, you know, a sponsorship, some kind of deal with them. And boy, it's working out pretty damn good. <laughs> It's working out pretty darn good for all of them, for Dana, for Portnoy, obviously for Molly and um, and and for the you know Patty the Batty. Patty. They are an electric factory. I mean, the place was on fire. But you know, Dave mentioned it, and also the broadcasters at the end of the um, at the end of the broadcast said, "Listen, people say it all the time. Oh, the place was crazy." You can't get a sense, and it is true, sometimes it's hard to get a sense on TV how electric a, a, an environment is. Like when I was at the Poirier-McGregor fight when McGregor broke his leg, the, it like, felt like they were going to blow the roof off the place. It was so crazy. And, and basically that's what they were saying is that show in London delivered in spades. I mean, exciting knockouts in the main event. The undercard had a lot of decisions, probably could have done with a little excitement, but the main card, my God, finishes, knockouts. I mean, obviously the, we'll talk about the main was massive disappointment but you know what sometimes it's one thing if a guy gets blasted out of there one punch and he's out but when something happens like that someone blows out their knee or something it's yeah it's it's unsatisfying and you feel a little bit short uh, shorted but that stuff happens when you're in a combat sport and and in a cage you know injuries happen I don't sometimes you just got to roll with the punches it's unfortunate you got to feel for um you got to feel for the fighter in the main event to have that happen, but we'll get two into weeks that. in a Let's, row, Ken. Two weeks oh, in a yeah. row, the main event. I know. You know, goes oh, down. Oh yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. You're right. Yeah, it goes Dang. down with a horrific injury, a terrible injury. Tom where, Aspen, all that's yeah. You know, we, space it on his name. And then, of course, you don't know. 
you know, just like the week before, you don't know if they're going to recover from these injuries. I mean, yeah. Or, or what the recovery process ultimately will be. Yeah. Well, let's jump into Molly McCann because I saw you, I saw you tweeted out that my girl from Boston was coming in. I wasn't aware of Goldie prior to the fight. And... Uh, Poor Goldie, she seemed like a deer in headlights once the fight started. And once Molly McCann got rolling and started letting her hands go, hit her with that spinning elbow, put her away, really put a pretty good beating on her. And uh, that was almost the um, segue into the main event, which is, of course, when she jumped. I, I love Molly McCann because she jumps over the cage. Security's telling her, obviously, you're not supposed to do that. You can get a sense from the security the way they freak out. But security's trying to corral her. She wasn't having any of it. She would have, she could have taken out the And that entire, was before like, she started drinking the whiskey. Exactly. She could have got through the, uh, she could have got through an NFL defensive line the way she went, jumped into Dave Portnoy's arms. He's jumping up and down. I was just so happy that Portnoy didn't collapse and drop her. He, he was jumping up and down. Then she's drinking whiskey. She's hugging people in the crowd. The whole time, security's trying to get her back in the cage. And she was basically like stiff on him, like, get out of here, guys. I'm celebrating. It's just an time. awesome personality, great it. character. Feel for the uh, opponent, Goldie. She was almost like a sheep being led to the uh, a lamb being led to the slaughter, and that's what Molly McCann did exactly what she's paid to do and got her out of there. Credit to her, huge win. How'd you like it? Yeah, everything you said, and and plus, you know, um, yeah, I, I tweeted, I tweeted before that, you know, my man cannot be happy. Boston's in the house, you know, being represented by Goldie, and then I, and then immediately afterwards, I said, well. Not too happy now, but um, <laughs> he kind of got the Red Sox treatment, you know. Uh, <laughs> I stay with I stay with Goldie. We'll be back, Goldie. Let's get it going. Learning experience. She's got scored on. Put it that way, just like uh, the Red Sox <laughs> did, you know, uh, bombarded. Uh, but yeah. look, the signature move now, I guess you could say, with Molly with the spinning uh, back elbow. But really, what set that up was the right hand. Uh, the right hand before that, you know, and she's very strong. She's a good striker. Uh, she's, you know, she's well adapted at everything. It looks like, like she's, you know, she's taking it very serious. Obviously, they all do. Um, you see her drinking whiskey. She knows how to play that part too and show her personality because it is about if you're going to make that extra money besides just your talent, uh, you have to have that charisma. You have to have that star factor, that it factor, and obviously having, um, uh, her and Patty uh, combined with that really well. They understand that. And Portnoy understands that. Dana White understands that. That's why they had that electric atmosphere there, which was reminiscent to me. I, I witnessed an atmosphere like that many, many, many years ago when I was out in Ireland with Barry McGuigan, uh, working with him. And he was both before he became featherweight champ and when he became featherweight champ of the world, uh, what an atmosphere. He used to fight at King's Hall uh, in Belfast. And, oh, I mean, really, it, it, like they said, uh, it'll make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Uh, it's that kind of atmosphere. And and you could, you could see it. You could feel it. If you're there, you could literally feel it. Like you feel a storm coming in the air, you know, when it's very humid out. And you could feel the wetness in the air. You could feel, you know, what's coming. Same thing. You could feel it. You could you could feel that electricity, and um, it, it's not too often you get that. So it, it's great to see that that kind of environment, that kind of atmosphere, uh, makes everything better. It's really special. Uh, as far as uh, Molly, you know, they they were great tandem uh, for the reasons I just said. Not just because of their talents in the inside that cage, but obviously their personalities and their their wit. You know, being smart enough to understand, you know, what they got and what, what they're doing. Uh, it was terrific. The thing that really I have to make a point about is uh, I look at my notes here. You know, as I said, it was it was really the, uh, the right hand that started and then led to that spinning back elbow. But her finishing quality, she's a terrific finisher, you know, right away. Uh, like in my sport in boxing, like Jack Dempsey was a great finisher. Mike Tyson was a great finisher. Joe Lewis might have been the greatest finisher of all time uh, uh, in boxing. But uh, she gets rid of people. You know, I mean, she she gets on you. And, and it, you're not surviving once she's got you hurt for the most part. So that's one of the things that really, really jumped out. 
um, to me. And, um, you know, as I said, she, uh, you know, she drank. I mean, during the interview, I stayed and watched the interviews. I don't always watch the interviews. I, I watched the interview afterwards and, you know, uh, after the whole show was over. And, of course, they were smart. They made sure they had her and Patty on. And she was still drinking that whiskey. She had a, she, she had about half the bottle uh, gone. So you know, she, <laughs> she's a character. She, she can handle her drink too, uh, as as we say. But uh, I, I think that covers it all for that fight because it wasn't long. But it was uh, all those all those things were rolled up in one. You know, the excitement, the uh, the talent, uh, the 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 atmosphere. You know, her, her playing into it. Uh, and then her being a finisher, she is a tremendous uh, finisher. She really is. I I think I look at boxing as one of the best finishers right now in in boxing as being a Japanese fighter, uh, in a way, uh, world champion, undefeated. Uh, she's one of the better finishers right now. I think maybe in UFC, she's she's really that. That good. I was going to ask you about that. Where do you place her with great finishers? I know you love a good finisher. My God, once she had, once she had, um, when she had my girl hurt, uh, she put it on her. Man, she didn't miss a shot. She was banging her head like a pinata. Um, but anyway, yeah, great fight. All right, let's talk. Patty the Batty gets the second round uh, rear naked choke, and going into the fight, Levitt was uh, considered to, considered by most to have the huge advantage on the ground as the grappler looked like he was desperately trying to get the fight there all day, all night. And uh, when he finally got it, if you notice, and I'm sure you did, he Patty had him perfectly positioned with the body triangle, but he had his right arm trapped in the triangle. So now he's trying to defend that rear naked with one hand, and you know, once once two hands against one, you're never going to win that battle. Even if even for a black belt against a beginner, it's very hard to defend with one hand. And uh, Patty gets it done via submission, and then uh, does a. Uh, 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 I don't know, some video game move after to him afterwards. They had been joking about who was going to twerk on who when they won, and Patty got it done. It was a good sport. looked like they both took it in stride and laughed it off, but, man, exciting. Patty brings the, uh, he brings the entertainment and excitement, his, and his speech after, his uh, comments afterwards with um, Michael Bisbing were uh, all class as well. He had a friend who committed suicide. Patty gave a whole spiel about mental health, and he couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with what he said. It's taboo for or especially in combat sports that have men have uh, emotions and feelings. But Patty hit the nail right on the head. He delivered the excitement, then showed um, great compassion and intellect in, in, in being able to uh, talk about issues that are plague a lot of people. So I figured you'd really appreciate his, uh, not only his performance, but his behavior after the fight. Yeah, you know, I'll put it this way. Uh, I'll piggyback off of that and start with that. Uh He's a full package. Um, uh, you know, I know a lot of people say he's rough around the collar in this area, that area. He keeps his head up in the air like a lantern in a storm. We, we would, the old timers would say in boxing. But he, so far, he's shown a granite chin. But um, he also showed his versatility in this fight. And for me, I, I marked it down. Uh, when I say the full package, uh, talent, toughness, charisma, smart, and human. And I think that's the the last part. It's the part obviously you're talking about, and that really struck me, the human side, with with all this, you know, how tough they are and how animalistic they can be, inside that octagon. Um, for the most part, I see nothing but good human beings, and they really are. Um, matter of fact, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I'm just going to take this moment. I I happen to be watching the news. I try not to watch it anymore because it's pretty depressing, to be quite frank. But I don't want to be one of these people with my head up and, you know, where. So I do peek at it. And um, before we came on, I saw uh, just, I don't know how to describe it, another horrific act. Uh, it was in New York City. Uh, they're talking about all the shootings over the weekend and uh, and uh, that have been gone the rise, on the rise, on the rise. And then... Um, all of a sudden, they show a video of these guys literally... When I first saw the video, I thought it was an accident. And then when I realized it was done on purpose, I I, I was just paralyzed by um, 
by my feelings. Um, they ran over this man, a pedestrian that was walking. They purposely ran him over and then jumped out of the car. Um, I Again, when I first saw the video without seeing the graphics and then hearing the commentary, I thought that by accident they hit the guy and they got out to help him. They jumped out to rob him. And I just... Oh, where are we going? You know, I mean, our civilization is 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 being lost. Uh, I mean, where is the humanity? That's why I used the word human side with Batty that really struck me, and I thought it was so apropos um, in talking about what he was talking about. But we need we need more than just talk for men out there. And and Patty's right. Um, to be able to talk about their feelings, not keep it in um, when you're depressed so you can get help. But I feel that everybody's going to need someone to talk to now um, when they start to see these acts, these, uh, the only word I can think of is, the only appropriate word I can think of is these uncivilized acts that uh, our society, our civilization is is just going into some kind of um, abyss. Um, I, I just... When is it going to stop? Uh, when you know? When are, when are we going to stop? And uh, what will stop it? Um, it's just you know I don't lose track. I don't lose track of all the beautiful people in this world in this country, obviously. Uh, but where is this other stuff coming from? How is it able to continue and not be obliterated? Uh, not be just wiped out, um, eliminated. We can't keep going this way. So I'm, I'm sorry our, our show is an uplifting show, and uh, but sometimes I think that just uh, just what's going on in the world can't be ignored sometimes. Sometimes it gets that bad. And, and it just, when, when you brought up this and then I talking about the human side and you brought up about patty and and then i had just seen this i just felt that i had to say that um i just i just want us to to be better so as a as a human race so anyway uh finishing up with 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 that with uh with patty um you know he he was just his versatility showed. Um, obviously, we know he's a terrific striker, but he um, he's smart enough to be getting good in all the areas he needs to be good to be the top guy there. He's doing that. Um, and, and one thing that really struck me, Ken, was with all the showmanship, you know, ahead of time that you see with him, even at the way and he goes to shake hands, then he goes like this with his hand <laughs> behind the head, you know. Uh, for, Mark. for what it's worth, I think that those guys have a, a, a pretty f good relationship. I yeah. think that they both, like, were clowning. I don't think he was trying to be disrespectful. I, just, well, uh, even if he was, I don't know that Levin was aware it was coming, but I think Levin is oh, the yeah, kind of, yeah. I think he's the kind of personality, the kind of person that went with it and understood it and understood it for what it was, as you're touching on, that it, it wasn't yeah. really being, that he was trying to be disrespectful in that way that it was part of yeah. the show if you will it was part of you know what you get now when you're going to fight patty um but yet he's respectful as far as inside the ring and uh inside the octagon and as far as being serious about that part of it and you know being a man if you will about that part of it but the other it's something to make extra money it's something that really helps the whole sport at the end of the day because obviously it it, it brings notoriety to the whole sport that there's this kind of entertainer just like mcgregor did you know he he, he did the same just like Muhammad ali did years ago he uh with his kind of uh personality and everything he was doing outside you know to promote fights uh it, it made him bigger but it also made everyone be in a position to make more money especially when they fought ali tyson too when they fought tyson they got more money but but it, it increased the purses um generally so uh i i think that patty has that effect on the sport too and i think for, i think for the most part not everyone but uh people like levitt i think he's got the kind of understanding to figure that out and and understand where it's coming from so to speak so uh i agree with you he he understood that and he um but with all the showmanship ahead of time as soon as it came 
you know, it came time. You know what I mean? Like Mills Lane would say, it's time to get it on. You know, Bruce Buffer says what he does. Hey, I, I'd like to get the throat lozenges that Bruce Buffer has because I don't know how that guy maintains his voice. <laughs> I really, it's crazy. I, I, He's I, screaming I, all I, the whole night. And I never hear his voice break. I, I'd like to get those licenses. I really would. See if you can find out for me. I know you're really hooked in to everything now with everybody. So you're the man. I got to go to I. I got to go Looking to you. Looking at the body. I, I got to go to you. Looking at the body and the physique on old Bruce and his age. I would imagine he's taking more than some throat lozenges. <laughs> that guy's fit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, hopefully I, I, you're not saying he's hanging out in some of those burger joints with Canelo, are you? No. No, I think he gets no, his meat you? from Mexico. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> just kidding. I, oh. I love Bruce Buffett. Right. No, He's no. also not punching yeah. people in the face for money, so whatever he is doing, good on him. He looks great. Hey, listen. And he, I, think, I think he might be a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Him and his brother, if not, he's, him yeah. and his brother were pretty damn smart making a cottage industry of, uh, you know, basically uh, yelling before fight starts. You know what I mean? I mean they own it. They I, own I, that they industry. They do own it. I mean, doing for a million the, bucks, I think he'll come and say, "Let's get ready to rumble." Yeah, doing fight, and there's toys. There's toys out with that stuff too. You know, uh, with a microphone, all that stuff. So they they're pretty damn smart. I think he'll come to your wedding and say, "Let's get ready to rumble for a million bucks." Okay, well, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> anyway, I have uh, seen him do private events. That could put, put stress on the we uh, marriage before it starts. <laughs> but you know, the. Getting back to the what I was saying, with all the showmanship and all that stuff, all the follies, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, then you see when it's go time, and I'm looking, and it wasn't missed on me, Ken. I'm looking at the the eyes and and just the posture of Patty before they go, and man, all that stuff's out the window. He is laser like. He is concentrated. He is a different person. And he's the person that has to be for all of them. You know, he, he's that he's that warrior. He, he's become that guy. And so that was the first thing is how his demeanor changed and got all business so fast, so serious. And to start the fight, Levitt started out really well. He got the geography. I always talk about geography. He got the geography he wanted early, uh, looking to grapple and obviously not strike with Patty. And... um. But Patty, you know, Patty, I, I, I'll put in another great fighter in there. I mean, Patty hasn't gotten to that level yet. Um, but uh, I, I'll put in the, the style bender, you know, who's been on our show, who, um, you know, who's, who's the middleweight champion of the world and, um, and is very, very, Adesanya, very talented, very special. He... He might never be the greatest grappler in the world. He's a great striker, and he might be one of the best, if not the best strikers of uh, Adesanya, but he's become damn good on that floor where, at the very least, he can escape what he has to escape and deal. And, Reminds and, me of John Jones in that way. In yeah. That you, he, they, you, you definitely don't want to be standing on your feet with John Jones, but you got to be careful what you wish for because he's an yeah. incredible wrestler and he knows enough to be dangerous where you don't want to be down there with him, but you definitely don't want to be standing with him, especially not if you fancy yourself a, a grappler. And what they do and what, what Adesanya has done has not only can he end himself down, he, he knows how to... You know, he's like one of those great quarterbacks in the NFL. He he knows how to escape the sack, yeah, so to speak. And I think that's the right way to put it. He he knows, you know, he knows how to defend those takedowns and when he's down. And um, I I saw Patty start to show some of that where he escaped the holds. And um, in that first round, he was you know he was losing around because of the the battle of geography was going to Levitt. but um, Patty escaped and. And finished the round so strong uh, that he might have won the round, even though he was losing yeah. up to that point. Um, That's a then, good point, Teddy, because he was getting he was losing the round. But he when he when he reversed and got on top, I, I didn't even look at the scorecards. But I'd be curious to see how they scored it. Maybe if Rob can see them, yeah, if they're Rob readily available, I'd there. be curious because I had Levitt win in that first round. But Patty, what Patty did in the last like I don't know 10, 20 seconds almost outweighed what Levitt did for the whole round because it was so dominating when, when Patty started to reverse and take control. But, man, what a fight. Just well, that's why I brought action. it up. Uh, and, then, yeah. um, and then, just as importantly, if not more, he picked up where he left off in the second round. 
And oh, yeah. uh, see, that's the thing, you know, that momentum. That's what the great ones do. Yeah. Well, yeah, the momentum. He he picked up a, no, you were there two fights later when we uh, tried to unify all the belts. But when I had Alexander Volzik, uh, the Ukrainian, and we won the world title, we we won it a great, against the great Adonis Stevenson up in um, Quebec, who at that yeah. time was probably the best puncher in boxing and a southpaw. If he wasn't the best puncher, he was the second best behind Wilder. But he was a better fighter, better boxer. And um, and we went up there and we won the title, and in the in the tenth round he got buzzed, uh, my fighter, and it, it was something that we were concerned about because we're in there with a great puncher, and he survived that. And then at the end of the tenth round he came on, really strong. He finished real strong, real strong. And I remember my instructions in the corner was pretty simple. Okay, bad. Bad start, good finish. Pick up where you left off, <laughs> and yeah. and and he did. He picked up in the eleventh round and he stopped him. That's exactly what Patty did. Patty picked up where he left off with that momentum, you know, with that good finish after a bad start and or a tough start, and and he um and then he showed the versatility uh, by submitting Levitt. Um, t- just a tremendous effort by him. As I said earlier, four big winners there, Patty, Molly, Dana, and Portnoy, and all the fans you know, that got a chance to be part of that atmosphere. And, you know, and us. And by the way, Patty won. Uh, all three judges gave that first round to Patty. Um, one quick thing about that um, Vosdick-Stevenson fight, for those people that don't know, the one thing I always think about when you talk about that fight is, number one, yeah, he got buzzed, all right. He got rocked with a bomb and came back even stronger, showing what kind of uh, intestinal fortitude Alex has. He's he's all man. But I always think about the conversation you had with him before the fight that you have with a lot of fighters before a big fight is that you don't know when. We don't know when, but the test is coming. You don't get to win a title without being tested. This guy's a real deal. You're going to get tested, and we're going to win or lose based on how you pass and how you handle that test. And that was perfectly timed with that 10th round shot that um, Stevenson hit him with it because here comes the test, and he passed the test, rebounds, arguably wins the round and goes on and wins the title and becomes the WBC he- a light heavyweight champion of the world. So for the fans out there that don't know some of these backstories, that, I mean, we could probably do an entire, you know, 10 episode series on the different fighters you've trained and different interactions you have before the fight and how those things play out. Obviously, most one of the most famous one is the fireman speech with Tim Bradley. I can't bump into a person without having them scream at me that we're firemen. <laughs> I'm like, all right, all right, I'm with you. I'm a fireman too. <laughs> but I love it. I love that the fans identify with that and uh, everyone appreciates that speech. It goes around uh, endlessly on TikTok and Instagram. I see it everywhere. My kids see it. They'll come in and be like, Dad, did you know that Teddy was screaming at the guy that he's a fireman? I was like, yeah, I know. I heard about that. <laughs> anyway, great fight. Let's talk about the um, Vulcan Olsdemir and uh, Paul Craig fight. Uh, Paul Craig desperately trying to get this one on the ground. Um, Ozdemir not wanting to go there. He wins the decision. Kind of a strategic battle. One guy looking for the geography he wanted. Another guy looking for the geography he wanted. And uh, kind of plays into everything you always describe in in, in handicapping these fights. Is who's going to get the geography that they want. And i um, curious to hear your take on this one. Well, perfect what you just said about the geography. Because that's what it was... It was so illustrative. You know, I talk about it all the time about how important the geography is, you know, uh, with fighters with certain styles, certain talents, certain abilities, right, uh, that they get the geography to use those talents, right? Um, you know, they, they need it. Uh, and some of them more so than others. Some obviously are more versatile. But, you know, some of them, uh, it's, I even made a note to myself, a kite needs wind, uh, a lizard needs sand, a fish needs water, a bird needs, a bird needs open sky. And, you know, some of these guys, they do, they need certain specific situations really to highlight their skills more than other guys. And it was so, so obvious and apparent in this fight. I mean, clear very early where Craig wanted with his skills, wanted and needed to be in the cage. He wanted to be on the mat. And 
And also, uh, how do you pronounce his name? I don't want to, I, I go to you because you're like Orson Welles. Uh, how, you went to college. I didn't go to college. How, how do you pronounce <laughs> I went to, I have oh, a sociology oh, degree Oz, from Framingham State. Ozdemir, Ozdemir, is that fair? Ozdemir, Ozdemir, okay, I would Oz, say is more oh, fair. Hardo. Okay. Oz, Oz, Oz Demir. Demir. Yeah, there it is. I got it. Uh, you know what Did that you get the like? other guy's name? Did you get the other guy's name right? Paul yeah. Craig? Craig is easy, yeah. <laughs> I, I could get that one. Craig I'm was a, you. He was a Joe play, Smith Jr. Uh, Craig was one of the <laughs> hockey players in the, one of the greatest upsets of all time. Um, Jim, wasn't Craig. It? Jim Craig. Jim Craig, Craig. Right? In Played Lake Placid, the you know, when they beat yep. the Russian Soviet Union team in the, in the Olympics. I mean, oh, God. you can't, can't get I me. I can't even I'm think sharp. about it without I'm getting chills. I'm fast on my feet. You ain't getting me kid you're not kidding me <laughs> come on maybe you've been you know, waiting another the star 10 that, years for me to you know my out. friend was a star of that team the great jack o'callahan from boston when i was a kid he was just a college kid right in 1980 i was nine years old and jack was a um, college kid at bu and a scrappy i knew this bastard. would lead into somebody that you know scrappy little bastard but he couldn't be a nicer guy i had a friend who lived in chicago who happened to live near jack o'callaghan about 10 15 years ago and my friend had a had a young daughter and she was going to school for a sh show and tell and they were just chit-chatting in the driveway and sh and he says yeah she's got a show and tell we're trying to decide what she's gonna bring i'm not exaggerating or, or joking around <clears throat> jack o'callaghan runs in his house comes back out with his 1980 gold medal gives it to the kid, gives it to my buddy's daughter and says, here, you go to school and you talk about this gold medal that I won against Russia in the Lake Placid Olympics. Well, how, how do you like that for a quality guy? Well, you know what? That's perfect with what uh, we started to show with a, a little bit, you know, a little bit into the show where I was talking about we need more humanity in this world um, and, and we got to get back to being uh, more, you know, just more human. And that's a perfect story. For Before I forget... So we have this on record. Please, Rob, Re Teddy, someone remind me prior to the um, Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner in November for anyone that wants to attend the thir first Thursday before Thanksgiving. The, the Thursday 17th. before Thanksgiving. November 17th. Instead, November 17th. Any of the fans out there that want to go, tickets will be available soon. Please come and attend. But Teddy, remind me and I'll ask Jack to give us a, uh, to get us a USA, um, Team USA jersey to raffle off for the... Um, for the for the foundation and um i'm sure he'll do it we just gotta I, I probably have to find a usa jersey i don't want to ask him to have to find a jersey for us too but if we get a jersey i'll send it to him have him sign it maybe we can even have it signed personalized to whoever wins the auction uh, that'd be great i appreciate that that would be great um we help a lot of people with the foundation um you know people that are in need people that fall through the cracks uh, people that have nowhere else to go sometimes to be quite frank um whether, yeah, whether so any the, of the fans yeah. want to come and say hello to us, Teddy, this is a great spot for people to come and meet us in person, meet some, I mean, you always get the greatest crowd, Tracy Morgan, I mean, some of the people that have been there, Mickey Ward, Evander Holyfield, you name it, George been Foreman's there. been there, I mean, every, yep. I listen, I appreciate it, Curtis, Curtis Martin, um, you know, the great running back, or I think he's the fourth lead in Russia of all time, but um, uh, Tony Dance, uh, Rosie Perez, the queen of boxing in New York, yep. right? I mean, I could go on and on and on and on, and, you know, Phil Sims, I mean, uh, Bill Parcells, uh, just just so many. I've, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed uh, that these people come out to help us raise money to help people in need. And, and like I said, without going too long with it, for the people that aren't aware of exactly what we do, um, we do whatever has to be done. We, if, if it's a if it's a single mom that has uh, been put into a shelter because she couldn't pay her rent because something went wrong, uh, we get her an apartment. We don't let her be in a shelter, uh, and and we take care of that just to get her started, just to get all you know, just a bridge to to get over that gap, to get over that the trouble waters, like Simon and Garfunkel would say in their song, um, just that little bridge to get there from A to B. Uh, that's that's what we try to provide. Uh, for people, you know, uh, we do incentive programs and at risk schools where families are making less than 35000 a year. We'll go in there and we'll say, look, if you guys start taking responsibility over who you are to the kids and, and start caring about who you are, because they don't care who they are, they get to that point. That's the problem. That's the problem. If you start caring about that, uh, we're going to drop off 200 tickets to a Yankee game, to a Mets game, to a Knicks game, to a Nets game, depending on what time of the year it is, and we're going to supply the buses. And if you 
you change your behavior and you start, you know, caring about who you are and who you represent and how you represent yourself uh, in school, the teachers will put you on a list. And guess what? You're going to go to that game and um, give them incentive to, again, just incentive to care just to care because some of these kids don't have fathers they got nobody there to provide that so uh, all those things and there's so much more so much more but again uh because of the goodness of people out there uh they help us with the fundraisers and we're able to take that help and take those resources and you know, get it to the right places so i appreciate ken for mentioning that uh if you guys are around anywhere uh, yeah, come, <laughs> come or donate to the foundation, whatever. Um, you would enjoy it. You'd, you'd enjoy a good night because you get to not only see these great celebrities and be with friends and good people and have a really nice night, but you also get to hear the people that have been helped. They come up and they do testimonials and, um, and, and it, it'll touch your heart. It'll touch your heart. And um, anyway, that's enough of that. Thank you. As far as Ozdemir, I got that down. Ozdemir, I'm sorry, Ozdemir. Uh, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I can't help it. I get, when I, I was doing, I did, I did four Olympics for NBC covering boxing, and one of them, I did it. Uh, I did three of them with the great uh, Bob Papa, and one I did with the great Marv Albert. And the one I did with Marv Albert, and you know this part, you met him You met him through being around with me in this business now in boxing and boxing, and you're meeting everybody. And, um, but you've met him. He, he's one of the good writers, one of the good guys out there. On the, they're, they're not all good, but he's one of the good writers out there <laughs> that really works hard at his trade and doing his thing in, in boxing. His name is Steve Kim. And um, he, he, was, he was there. And, and he was... Um, I, I think I, I'm trying to remember. I might have got him hired for that job. Uh, he was he was there to do the research to help us with the research. You know, I forget which one it was. It might have been. Uh, it might have been. Let's see. It might have. Oh yeah, it might have been 2000. That's how long ago it was uh, in in Australia. Uh, it, it might have been that one. But anyway. Yeah, so, Steve uh, Kim told me about that. He was like, yeah. you talk about intimidating. He's like, I get to be the research assistant for Teddy. He goes, it was, needless to say, it was uh, demanding and uh, intimidating. Yeah, but other than that, it was great. And and then But he loves he, you. He, uh, yeah, listen, I appreciate him. And so uh, that's why I got him for the job. So he was there and um, uh, Kevin Monaghan, who was running NBC, he was also part of getting him there. And um, does a good job. Does a, did a great job there, and also helps the foundation too. Him, uh, so uh, we're, we're we're there, and you know, Marv is one of the greats of all time, and you know, he's a stickler. If you're going to be great at some, of course, you're a stickler for making sure everything's right. And the, the research sounds was familiar. A, yeah, yeah, myself, I guess. <laughs> and. And you know, but you have to be. I mean, otherwise, you know, of you're course. not, not going to be that good at what you do. And so he, we, we we not only had to get all the research, we had to get the phonetic spelling for some of these names. These these <laughs> names were tough. They were tough. They were tough. You like the Thai I, names, don't you? Oh my goodness! I they love reference it. you uh, like, how do we pronounce this? Ask Teddy Ellis. He's an expert in yeah, Thai. Yeah, and, Teddy and then, talk Thai. And I would just say, I, but I could move on my feet a little bit. I would just say, yeah, uh, Vitamin Blue from Thailand. You know, I got right around <laughs> that one. From uh, and but Marv was such a pro and and, and such a perfectionist. You know, uh, he said, Teddy, we can't do that. We got to pronounce their names. Okay, you're right, Marv. So we would ask Steve Kim, and this was really funny. We would ask. Now, listen, we're going beyond his really his call for duty, uh, his 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 you know his job. Uh, description uh, description a little bit because he's there for research he's doing a great job but now we're asking him to help us with the pronunciation of <laughs> of some of these fighters so we're, we were desperate so we turn i never forget so marv turns to steve so steve how do you pronounce this one he goes smooth it out <laughs> and for the rest of the olympics that's what marv would say whenever we had trouble with one marv would look at me and say teddy smooth it out and in the, in the words of the great steve kim smooth it out smooth it out so i smoothed it you know, out so the, when you say that it, when Austin. you say um about marv albert being a stickler that actually reminds me very much of you when i say that as a compliment and when people ask me how do you how's it working with teddy i say it's the best 
He's like one of my best friends. But I said, imagine playing football for Bill Parcells or um, Belichick. The players love playing for them, but when he's but when he's like asks for something and needs something, there's not playtime. It's this is serious business. At least when we're in camp, it's this is very very serious. And you know, at, at times you're like, oh, this guy, but you understand why he's doing it, and it makes sense. But that's what all great coaches have in common is like they're very serious about their craft. But you know it's coming from the right place. But the message might not always be delivered with a, a bouquet of roses and more like a foot up your ass. <laughs> there's no room for roses sometimes. You know what I mean? Nope. Uh, nope. And, and, not in this you, business. You don't get two chances at it. You get one chance at it, and you better make it That's right. It. And there's a lot on yep. the line. And I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility for a fighter. So I better get Completely it right. Completely agree. I mean, all of that as a compliment. I'm yeah. just no, saying no, that I people agree. don't understand. I, I mean, this I understand serious. that. I appreciate that, and I do um, very much. So, Ozdemir, thank you, um, yep. Mr. Orson Wells. Um, so, listen, <laughs> as I said, so it was so important to get to geography right in this one. And that, as I said, right away you saw that. And while Craig is looking to get on the mat, Ozdemir needed or wanted to be standing, and they both jockeyed for position to get to geographies they wanted. And it made for, tell me if you agree with me, Ken, it made for a strange first round, a, a weird first round, a close round, but a weird first round with the edge for me was going to Ostermere, uh for ring generalship. Um, so, and then in the second round, Craig was winning and Ostermere closed really strong and maybe stole it a little bit like Patty when he closed strong after uh, you know the end of the first round when when he closed strong on Levitt. So uh, you know here you are, you're going into you know you're going into the to the next round. Um, like I said, the third round now, and and it was it was really close. Uh, at at the end, uh, it was it was close, but. You could make an argument for Ozdemir to possibly even be up to nothing. I don't know what the scorecards were, the actual cards cards on that were, but um, I I was seeing it that way. I got the I've got the cards here. Thirty twenty seven sweep for Ozdemir. He won every yeah. round. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, it, it was it was some that was close, but that's the way I saw it. In the end, when you got to the third round. I, I just thought Ostermeyer uh, fought his fight more. You know what I mean, Ken? He just he fought yep. the fight he needed to fight more than Craig fought his fight. And I I agreed. I had Ostermeyer, uh, you know, win in that fight. So that's all right. Let's get into the um, let's get into the uh, Krylov and Gustafson fight because prior to this fight started, you sent out a tweet that basically said. Uh, Krilov uh, built quite a sweat woman up in the dressing room ready for a fast start and like I said for a fast start bang and you hit the nail right on the head first round stoppage he KOs Alexander Gustafson tough to watch the big Gustafson the legend go out like that but in the UFC <laughs> you know more so almost in the NFL not for long uh, this is an ever-changing landscape and there's a new batch of killers coming up every single week and I'll tell you one thing I think these these young guys they have <clears throat> they have almost like they're getting started earlier they have a better understanding of how important all the techniques are used going back to the beginning when you had uh, Hoist Gracie winning everything because no one else really knew jiu-jitsu and clearly all things being equal one discipline versus another jiu-jitsu obviously had the advantage because you had all these kung fu karate everything coming in okay let's all get in the cage Best man wins, jiu-jitsu trumps everything. But as the sport evolved and we added in the good wrestlers came in with an ability to strike and an ability to grapple a little bit, very quickly they adapted into these like super athletes like, uh, to your point earlier, Israel Adesanya. And before I get your thoughts on that fight, I just want to say another thing with these young kids is 
they have access now to more advanced training techniques, more advanced nutritional techniques. And one of the things that I would guarantee that they're all taking is Athletic Greens, number one sponsor of the fight with Teddy Atlas. And again, they're a sponsor because I reached out to them. I've been taking this stuff for years. It's one of the most important supplements I take. For those that know, and maybe those who don't, I have been running competitively for the last several years. I've gotten faster every year for the last 15 years. At 51, I was second in the world at uh, London Marathon. I won the I Masters think the guy that won York. cheated. I still don't yeah, know did. where that... 100%, 100% I don't know. cheated. Really? He I mean, knows what he did. He where was that guy? Did. Where was he? he? Uh, we couldn't keep track of him. Yeah, he started in a different start area, got a minute up the road on me. I thought I was winning when, when, the, when the race merged together. I had a lead. I couldn't even see the people behind me. So I ran somewhat conservatively thinking I was winning, waiting to see someone in the age group pass. They never did. I want to my rematch. surprise, he was. I want yeah, a rematch. I'll get I want him. a rematch. I'll get him. He knows. He knows. I've called him out in the New York Times and other publications, so he has to live with that because he knows what he did. Nevertheless, one thing that I never miss, even when I'm traveling to London, is my Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. This stuff has everything, 75 whole food sourced ingredients. If nothing else, it's an insurance policy to make sure you're getting all your fruits and vegetables for the day. I'm not joking around. I take it every single day. I've, I, I took it before they were a sponsor of the show. Everyone knows it, it is the truth. They sponsor the show. We love them. But those travel packs are invaluable. So if you go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas, they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Tell them we sent you in the notes and maybe they'll give you an extra bonus prize. But I love this stuff, Teddy. I know you've been taking it too with your new weight loss and obviously it's work and making sure you get some extra calories, but not not uh, wasted calories. All the stuff that you really need, 75 whole food sourced ingredients. Listen. How do you like it? I, no, I, I love it. And um, I back it up, everything you just said. And I just want to, before I go on with the Krylov, uh, Gustav's, Gustafsson? Gustav? <laughs> How do we pronounce it? Gust Gust yep, you got it. Gustafsson. Before we go on with that, I just want to say that for me, you're the world champion in the Masters. You're number one. Because, no, really. Because, uh, and listen, you've done other races where you've won it outright. But this one, I really, all joking aside, I thought you won. Um, but uh, your next big marathon, just for our fans out there, I believe is Tokyo. Am I correct? Is that going to no, be? No, no. Uh, uh, nine, nine weeks. I got Berlin on September Berlin. 25th. Well, you're so all the German fans. Yeah. Mr. Worldwide. I've got September 25th. I've got Berlin. And then I'm going to try. Very difficult task. Two weeks later, I'm going to try to rebound and go to Chicago. I'm trying to win my age group at all the world marathon majors, which includes London, New York, Boston, Chicago, Berlin, and Tokyo. I've got Boston and New York. I've I've already won those. I also won the 40 and over master's division at New York City. Proudest athletic accomplishment of my life. Former winners include legends, Olympia, Olympic legends, Abdi Abdi Rockman, Meb Kaflesky, like real runners. And listen, I'm not I'm not naive. I know that if those guys show up, they're F Abdi Abdi Rockman, five-time Olympic runner, running a 220 marathon, he's gonna beat me every day. But as they say, you can only, f you can only race the people who show up. 50 years old, you run a two 229. That's pretty damn good. That's pretty damn good. Uh, that's extraordinary. And, and again, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Um, I, I thought Thank it was you. Tokyo, but you're the international man. So Tokyo who, in March. Uh, who knows? In March, March in to Tokyo, Tokyo. All, all over the world. Um, you better win. I hate to put extra pressure on you, Ken, but you better win in Berlin. September 25th, that's my anniversary, 40th anniversary for me and Elaine. Yep. And, um, oh, 40. Wow, that's a big one. Yeah, it's a big one. And you, you better not let us down. All right? No pressure. Uh, I won't. No I won't. Pressure, I'll put it I this know. way. I'm either going to win or uh, c come back in a body bag. <laughs> win or die trying. Don't, don't put me in. Don't put me. Don't put me in that situation. <laughs> no pressure now. Now, no, guess what? Now I just I just deflected those. the pressure. Hold on, let me I just see. deflected the pressure. So now yeah. we're both under pressure. You're yeah. hoping I don't no, die. No, and no, I'm no. Of I win. course. Yeah, of course. That's yep. So um, no, that's all great stuff. Proud of you. Keep it up. Kid. Thank you. I appreciate you. And um, as far as Krylov Gustafsson, uh, you know, you're right. 
I, I was trying to make money for you and our fans out there. I really was. I'm, uh, you know, I'm half kidding. But I was trying to make money for you guys to go to my bookie because I, I sent that tweet out just before... Uh, I, I sent that tweet out before the fight. Uh, and, the, and the tweet, uh, I, don't, I don't know if we put it up there, but the tweet, I don't know if you saw it. I think you saw it. Um, but the tweet was... Krylov has worked up a really, really intense sweat in the locker room because they showed a they showed a shot of him coming up in the locker room. Soon as I saw what I saw, and I, you know, that went to me the way it would go to me, a guy in the fight business my whole life. I said I sent a tweet immediately. Krylov has such a sweat going. Look for a very fast start out of him and bang I, I think you touched on it but bang what happens he goes out there and he drops Gustafsson um, within seconds and then of course he gets a first round stoppage so that was again I, I hope you got on that Ken because I hope some of our fans uh, I know you're, you're able to maybe get these exotic bets sometimes where you could bet a first round knockout or something um, may, maybe somebody took a flyer with that and again I'm, I'm, I'm kidding as much as I'm being serious but that it played out perfectly you're not always right with these things when you see them and your instincts kick in you know from your your years of experience but as soon as i saw him you know lathered up if you will the old timers would say lathered up with the sweat as soon as i saw that i said there's gonna be a fast start for christen uh i mean krylov and um it might be problems for gustafson and sure enough uh bang boom bang bang boom uh like uh the great jackie gleason would say in his honeymooners uh it was over uh the right hand started it for krylov um then a short you almost couldn't see it ken uh a short left uppercut on the inside finished it very fast but very impressive against the legend yeah as you said yeah, legend. Sad to see uh, Gustafson go out like that because he is, he's is he been around so long and he's so good. But like I said, these young kids are getting so nice and so developed. It's... Um it's a hard road, but to your point, as you've always said, like on any given night, the old, the old, uh, the old lion can show up and defend when he has to and put on a performance. But on a consistent basis, I um, once you start to see that tide shifted, like you say, also it's hard to see the tide being stopped. The sandcastle slowly washing out to sea might make one more stand, one, might survive one more tide, but eventually the tide always wins. Um, Anyway, great performance uh, for Krylov. Great win over a superstar in Gustafson. Not too many um, people beat Father Time, right, Ken? Not too nope, many. Not, not too many. And um, but like you said, well, that's going to come possibly to to light in the Triple G third fight with Canelo. You know, I'm not going to give anything away with our fight plan that uh, hopefully the fans will be looking to see. Um, but. I I talk about that. I talk about does the old lion, and of course the old lion would be Triple G, does the old lion get a chance to roar one last time? Yeah. I mean, that's that's <laughs> yeah. what it's going to come down to. So, um, based I'm, on the line they're showing on that Triple G oh, yeah, fight, I think people think, are, I don't know. think enough people realize, to your point, that, that is, that's a potential outcome. I mean, You've always said it that you thought Triple G won them both. For the first fight, he 100% won. It's hard to dis it's hard for anyone to make a case for Canelo. I don't have a necessarily a problem with the second I fight do. as much. I, I thought it was I maybe do. a draw, but I thought, no, I thought I, he I won both. But I hear what you're saying. That's Listen, fair. they were That's both fair. different. The first one the way they went about it, the way he went about it, Triple G went to get him. And he did what he used to always do, press the fight, go after the guy, and, and he won the fight. And he got robbed. They they robbed him. The way they rob you when they give a draw in boxing, it's it's basically like not leaving fingerprints. They use latex gloves, and, and they make it a draw because it's too obvious to make it a win. So they do it. That's, that's the way they do it. 
and they did. And the second one I, it was different. Triple G boxed more, used the jab more, but he fought down the stretch when he had to. When 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 the lion had to roar, he roared again down the stretch. And um and I thought he won that fight. But no doubt that Canelo's a different guy now. He's now the bigger, stronger guy. How that happened, don't ask me. I don't know. Um, that's that's we've talked about that in the past. Uh, watch the fight plan. You get to know more about my full feeling about that. But um, he's now the bigger, stronger guy, and he's more confident guy. He grew up in that second fight. Canelo, where he wasn't so sure of himself the first time he met Triple G that he could handle this level of a guy. Um, but the second time he was much more sure of himself, and that's why he brought the fight the way he brought the fight rather than the first time. So, eh, listen, it might be too late. You know, uh, these fights, these, these potentially great fights often get made just too late. Just too late. Yeah. And this one might be one of those. Should be a good payday for Triple G to sail off into the sunset regardless of outcome. Um, he has looked a little bit aged in some of his recent performances, but I'm not discounting him. My only point with the second fight is, and I give Canelo a lot of credit, at least from my perspective. I thought Canelo in the first fight waited and Triple G, I thought, took the fight to him. In the second fight, I was actually impressed that Canelo was pressing the action and it turned it a little bit. So I didn't have a problem, as much of a problem with was that. a different guy in the liked, second fight. He was a different guy. I think guy, you could make the case for Triple G being one zero and one in those fights, and Canelo having a loss. But it is what it is. We're going to get the third one, and so you know. All right, so Trip. I'm sure Triple G knows he's got to like knock him out cold, because uh, if he just knocks him down in every round, they'd be lucky to get a split decision. Let's face it, he's not. He's going off into the sunset. That's pretty obvious. And Canelo's still the cash cow. So from a business perspective, I'm sure everyone recognizes that, as far as business goes, it's better to have Canelo win for the for the power players in the sport regardless of what side of the street you're on here so that's working against triple g but he, he's gonna know that he's got a tough task he knows that he's got a tough task not only a tough task in the way that he has to uh you know beat obviously it first comes down to beating the man not only does he have to beat the man who's younger than him and now more confident and stronger and bigger, which, again, that, that was a flip-flop, right? Triple G used to be the bigger, stronger guy. But now he's also got to beat the guys outside the ring, the three judges there that, you know, uh, he's got to beat them. And, and you know what? In some ways, they're harder to beat sometimes than the man in the ring. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Right before the co-main start, a friend of mine, Quincy Jones, uh, sent me a text and was like, hey, I like um, <clears throat> I like the two underdogs or the two um, Chris Curtis and um, Curtis Blades heading into the thing. I said, and I'm very rarely right on these things. <laughs> the UFC is so hard because an underdog can win here. And I said, listen, gun to my head, I'm taking uh, Jack Hermanson and Curtis Blades. I think that they're being discounted too much. Sure enough, Hermanson goes out and handles Chris Curtis pretty well. The, judge, the judges had it 29, 28, and 30, 27, all for Jack. Um, good battle, though. Entertaining. How'd you like that one? Curtis was the shorter man, you know. So we talk about geography. He had to come forward, right? He had to own the inside. And Hermanson was smart. Um, really, you know, I always like to give credit to these fighters that sometimes separate himself also with the cerebral part of this, uh, not only the physical part. And, and he was smart. Uh, he, he literally used his legs to control range and stay outside by moving um, his legs and then kicking with them. Um, you know, most of the time, most people use a jab uh, when they're taller and longer to keep range and the edge on the outside. But Hermanson used his kicks uh, to do that. That's unusual. So uh, that's, that's the first thing that struck me. Uh, Curtis was badly hurt in the second round, and um, he, did, he did a hell of a job to survive. Uh, and he was definitely down two to nothing. Uh, he needed to start taking chances uh, and step, you know, step with Hermanson when he pulled out and catch him, you know, try to catch him, you know, with uh, with some shots. That, and he tried that in the third round. Um, but Ken, it was too little too late. Curtis also, uh, I believe he hurt himself 
following Hermanson around the ring and not cutting the ring down and not using the jab to stabilize Hermanson a little bit, maybe, you know, give him something to think about, if you will. Um, stabilize him a little bit on the outside, uh, even if he jabbed a little to the chest. And and also not going to the body was a mistake for Curtis. Um, because when you got a guy using his wheels, take some air out of those wheels. And one of the best ways to take some air out of those wheels um, is to go to the body uh, in both sports, my sport and UFC or MMA. But one of the ways also he could have done it, obviously, in the MMA, is take out the legs with kicks. Um, he really wasn't, you, you didn't see his game plan concentrated on those things. That's the one thing that jumped out, is sometimes yeah. these guys fight plans or lack of, you know, that, that I didn't really see. And I like Curtis, but I've, uh, and he's a good banger. Um, and, I, you know, good puncher. I, I didn't, I just didn't see that game plan. Um, but obviously the game plan for for Hermanson was, was very obvious, very apparent. Um, and, and he fought, look, at the end of the day, Hermanson fought a disciplined, smart fight, very efficient, not, not very exciting, um, but very efficient. What matters is, you know, that he won, obviously. Yeah, that's a pretty good summation. Uh, with that, let's jump into the main event. Super disappointing. Not much to discuss here. Um, Curtis Blades and Big Tom Aspinall. Aspinall. Looks like Aspinall. He threw a kick, and again, to my untrained eye, I thought it might have glanced right off the kneecap when when uh, Curtis Blades checked yeah, it, I which did is too. what I you're supposed that, to do. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, which I, is I, what you're supposed to do. You were a tweeting machine, so I might have I might have missed one. Um, but he kicked him. It clearly like hit him somewhere. My guess is that it broke his shin, broke his leg, and I probably should have confirmation of that. Maybe maybe um, uh, Rob can let me know if it, if it's confirmed he broke his leg. But you know, at that level, Teddy, these guys are so tough. In the first round, you'd have no reason to fake an injury there. Oh, Nothing had please, even happened. Please. He kicked him stepped back almost like conor mcgregor did against dustin and um while we didn't see the leg snap in half clearly you could see when he put pressure on that right leg he just buckled and even blades like it's funny if you look closely at blades you can see him almost reach out like showing concern like oh damn are you, are you all right? It's the the sportsmanship and some of these guys is great. And they're both classy guys, Aspinall and uh, Curtis Blades, always, always with the utmost class and respect for the opponents. You know, they all they all react the way they have to react when someone's, you know, crap talking them. But uh, I think I think of Curtis Blades as a gentleman. Same with Tom Aspinall. And uh, the crowd was out in uh, big time for Tom. So unfortunate to have it end this way. I mean, you think about it from the fighter's perspective. They get a win and uh, show money and win money. You know, typically I would imagine these heavyweights are probably one to three hundred thousand to show, another one to three hundred to win. So to break your leg and lose that that win money and oh, the chance to get that win money it just sucks. You hope that behind the scenes the UFC helps these guys out when there's something so unfortunate. And Curtis Blades, on the other hand gets the win and gets the show and win money because technically he wins the fight. But not much to discuss in terms of tactics, but what would you think about the outcome? Yeah, first of all, I thought it was the knee. That, that was my first thought, and you touched yeah. on that. I thought it was the knee, but whatever it was, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, that's, it also brought me right to this. I don't know if I tweeted this, but I have in the past, and I'll say it now. That's why I always say these guys can't get paid enough money for me, boxers and, and the MMA fighters. They risk so much. It's so dangerous what they do. Everything is on the line what they do. Um, they Again, they, they can't make enough money for me. They deserve whatever. And I'm so happy that Dana you know, has that practice where he gives a fifty thousand dollar bonus to the you know always to the performer fight of the night, night knockout you know, of the night yeah, submission it's just, yeah it's great but rob's by the way rob says no official word yet and if i said blades i obviously i meant aspinall hurt his knee if i yeah, misspoke, aspinall. Really, apologies uh, yeah. listen again they can't get enough money for me they can't you can't pay them enough for this reason because of what they're facing every time they get in that ring that something serious is going to happen so um i was looking forward to this uh, I tweeted that too because for me I was looking at power and technique combined uh, and I thought it promised to be explosive. Um, then just like I said earlier in the main event uh, in last week's UFC uh, card, 
obviously you get this terrible injury uh, in the first round. So um, just as it was starting to heat up too, you know, I mean, because they were, you know, they were striking, they were, you know, they were they were throwing those shots. Uh, they were showing the shot, throwing some shots here, and um, so I again, it was just just unfortunate. It was just unfortunate. Um, I hope right right after you got past that, I said, gee, I just hope obvious that he recovers fully um from this you know uh uh you know and it uh as i said they they can't make enough money these guys as as far as i'm concerned so uh and that's uh, there was i'm looking at my notes to see if there was anything else i i think that's pretty much covers it all i i know that we got some good fights coming up some very interesting ones coming up. I, I was looking at the calendar, Ken, when they put up the calendar of fights coming up uh, for UFC. And tell me if I saw this one right. I thought I saw that they put up that Nate Diaz was fighting Shemayev. Uh, uh, Shemayev. Uh, Shemayev. I'm Kamzat sorry. Shemayev. You are correct. Yeah, they and, think uh, that they're feeding Nate the to the Lions on his way out. Is that... By the way, I got company just walked in. Um, yeah, my Joseph. Buddy, my buddy right here. He, he wants to take over my spot. Everybody wants to take my <laughs> spot over. Everybody wants to take. <laughs> Love you, bud. So, uh, one of you never know what uh, great uh, guest appearances we're going to have on this show. You know, it's live. We do it uh, real, the real deal here. You know, it's funny, Teddy. My, my oldest son, he's become obsessed with, like, you know, YouTube shows, YouTube creators, mainly the kids' ones. So for the first time today, he was like, Dad, are you recording the podcast? I said, yep. No, they've never shown any interest other than to say hello and Jake Paul or someone else or come on and say hi to you. But he's like, can I help you with the podcast? I said, sure, but I'm going to have headphones on. So for like the first 30 minutes, he was sitting in the chair over there just watching, supervising. I said, you want to be the producer? You can help me. And he's like, all right, what can I do? I said, just watch and see what happens. Then I realized he can't really hear what you're saying. So he uh, got bored and headed well, for the hills. Well, I don't blame But he's interested. He loves it. You know... We, I mean, we are so blessed, uh, both of us, you know. Um, you know, Rob hasn't gotten to that point in life yet where, you know, if, if God blesses them with that and they want to have family, they have family, but uh, as far as kids, but he's got a beautiful wife and he's obviously got his family. But we are so blessed with our kids. Uh, I look at your family. You know, you sent me a, a video, a beautiful video the other day from them. And I look at them and how beautiful they are and what great kids they are and what a great job you and your wife are doing. And then I look at how Thank blessed you. I am with my two children uh, and, uh, and my grandchildren, my three grandchildren. God, God, we are so blessed and we are so fortunate. So um, anyway, before the star of the show came in, where was I? Teddy, let's jump into the boxing. There was a smallish show on ESPN Plus on Saturday night. We had um, Joe Gonzalez in there against Dog Bay. Uh, super close fight. Uh, Dog Bay gets a razor thin decision. One judge had it for um, Gonzalez. Two judges had it. One uh, Dog Bay went in by two. So one round swing there. Um, Good back and forth, little guys. A lot of action. How'd you like it? No, great. Really, Ken, terrific, tremendous. Uh, really, really good fight. It was a phone booth fight. Um, that's what I call it because uh, <laughs> it could have been fought in a phone booth. It was all inside for the most part. Uh, I thought it could go either way, um, but I also thought it could... Uh, for me, I thought it could be a draw or go to Gonzalez for landing the heavier shots. But again, very close. Um, I was, you know, they gave it to to Dog Bay. Uh, no one deserved to lose. It was the, it was one of those fights where there was so much on the line because it was a title eliminator. So you know, the the guy that wins knows what he's getting. Uh, my my one problem was that it came down to the last round on the judges' cards, Ken, and. All three of them gave the last round to Dog Bay, and I thought that Gonzalez won that last round. So I, 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 w I was a little maybe dismayed at that. But again, uh, you can't argue with the fight. You can't argue with 
these two warriors gave. They gave everything. Uh, as far as the breakdown of the fight, Dog Bay won the first two or three rounds, probably uh, at least the first probably the first two at least uh while gonzalez was the aggressor which he was the whole fight he was not the effective aggressor uh early on he was just walking in and dog bay was was fresh and um he was able to pot shot him on his way in because he wasn't well gonzalez wasn't doing what i used to talk about when i was calling the fights he wasn't putting bugs on the windshield <laughs> which you know to 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 just distort the vision of the guy you're pressing. You know, come in behind the jab. Put bugs on the windshield. Make it hard for the guy to pot shot you on the way in. He wasn't doing that. He was just walking in. And that's why I thought he lost the first couple of rounds um, because he wasn't coming behind the jab. But then he began to come behind the jab. And he started, he was the biggest, stronger guy. Gonzalez, and he started to wear down Dog Bay a little by by just being so relentless, you know. And you used the analogy that I go to a lot earlier in the show about the ocean, and Gonzalez was becoming the ocean, you know, crashing into the shore at high tide. And uh, he just kept coming, but Dog Bay, to his credit, he also showed great heart. They both did. But he showed great heart and grit, Dog Bay. And as I said, it was a really good fight, uh, worthy of a title eliminator. You don't always get them. Um, you definitely don't get when you see the mandatory, the so-called mandatory with these corrupt organizations, when you see the um, so-called mandatory against the champion, a lot of times that's a, that's a joke. Um, but this title eliminator was not a joke. Uh, it was worthy of that title, if you will. Uh, for me, two winners on display. Uh, both got hit a lot. I'm, I'm going to leave it with that. Both got hit a lot, and I think they should take long rests before getting back in that ring. I know that they're going to run into you know getting ready for the next one, but when you take that kind of... Uh, when you're in that kind of tough fight in this business... Uh, I, I think that the trainers and the managers and the promoters, uh, the commissions, everybody should should say, hey, let's make sure he gets a, a good amount of rest. And um, class and sportsmanship shown by both. I loved it. I love that. Uh, matter of fact, that reminds me, just go back to that one of those UFC fights where um, one of the ones on the weekend where – Afterwards, uh, it was the one with the injury, the uh, the disappointment one with Blaze and what was it, Blaze and uh, Aspinall, where I think there was a picture, Ken, of the two of them uh, sharing a pint, if you will, yeah, uh, at a pub over there in uh, London. You know, the our, our great brothers and sisters over there that we love across the pond. They call it a pint. They were sharing a pint. I I think it was beautiful. I think it was beautiful. Um, I love it. I, I, I love it. Yeah, because here they are. They could be animals uh, in their workplace, ready to take each other's head off. And, and then afterwards, nothing but mutual love and respect and admiration for both. And they show it. They show the human side, yep. the, which, which I think is a theme for this show. A thing for this show. You know, I'll, I'll finish with this, Ken, and I'll leave it in your hands. But we were talking about it, and I was talking about the, obviously we were talking about Patty doing a great speech after the win about men having to talk more about suicidal thoughts if they're having depression, don't keep it within. I talked about the horrific scene that I saw on the news uh, before I came in to do the show with somebody, with people running over somebody in the streets of New York uh, and then getting out of the car uh, to mug them, to, to rob them. I mean, where's our humanity? Where's our civilization? And I just want to leave it with, here we got these tough men. You don't get tougher than these men. You don't get tougher than them uh, in boxing and UFC, uh, MMA in general. And, um, and, and they, they, know how, they know how to show humanity. 
come on. I mean, you know what I wish, Ken? When I saw that horrific scene with, with the guys running over that pedestrian in New York over the weekend and then getting out to rob him, I wish that we could take a whole bunch of professional fighters and UFC fighters and put them around the, the country, put them around the cities that are having this horrific violence and put them on, just put them anonymously on different street corners. Spread them out, <laughs> you know? Was just, it Kevin Holland who's caught a couple? Uh, I, uh, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's wrestled yeah, down a few yeah. different burglars and no, bad really, guys. Ken, Ken, I'm telling you, really, I know I'm, uh, people are going to say, well, Teddy, you can't do I wish to God, I'm just telling you what I wish. You could take some of these guys, and they're the kind of human beings that would do it. They would do it. And, <laughs> of course. And, and put them, just mingle them out there, spread them out there without anybody known, unbeknownst to the general public, that they're out there. And then let some of these cowards do what they do, not knowing that they might be there. Oh, my goodness. And let them just do their <laughs> thing. Let them, let them do, turn the, just turn the videos off. Let them do what they got to do. And you know what? That reminds me. That of, might that eliminate reminds, some of this uncivilized behavior we're getting. That might eliminate a, some of it. That's a good point. It reminds me. I, sh I sent you and Rob a video this weekend that I, I, I assume it's recently was recently made, but Sonny Edwards, a British fighter, was getting trolled online and invited the kid, the troll, to come down to the gym, which Deontay Wilder has done too. They put on gloves, and my God, Sonny Edwards like beat him about the ring, and the kid was trying, and Sonny Edwards was letting him throw punches, and then eventually, occasionally would just crack him. But unfortunately, I think for the fighter's sake, I think they're going to eventually hurt someone. I get it, you want to do it, but at some point, you're like, listen, the guy's way out of his depth. You're going to hurt him. And I get wanting to straighten out a troll. But hopefully people seeing those videos will recognize sometimes what you say online is going to come back to bite you in the butt. And uh, Deontay Wilder and Sonny Edwards have both beat the crap out of trolls who then not only talked that crap, but at least showed up to take their beat and then they got one. So anyway, I digress. Teddy, we've got one. Uh, we've got a good show coming up next week for the UFC match uh, uh, rematch for Amanda Nunes and uh, Juliana Pena uh, from Dallas. Awesome match. I'm dying to see what happens in this one. They can both fight like nobody's business. Yeah, yeah. I, what do you think? How, how you like that one? No, I look forward to it. I just look forward. Um, obviously, is that's the rematch. Um, Correct. That's the rematch. Correct. Pe Pena's, Pena's got the title. Big upset. That was a big upset. Big because one. Because that was really big. Nunes was, well, is a legend, but, you know, yeah. at the time she was like uh, legendary, unbeatable, and kind of like yeah. very similar to when when Holly beat, um, uh, who was a legend at the time too, um, the the woman fighter. Uh, what, what was the name? I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now, but... Holly, when Holly Holm beat, Holly um, Holmes, yeah, Holly. beat um, oh my God, why am I spacing? Yeah, um, she's yeah. in the wrestling now, two yeah. time, uh, Olympic judo player. Um, That's right. Revolutionary. Yeah. Rob, get it in there. Yeah, it Ronda is. Rouse, Thank you, Rob. Rowdy Ronda Rousey, yeah, now a teamwork. WWE superstar. But yeah, when Holly yeah, Holm beat that. Ronda Rousey, that whoo, was huge, everyone huge. was surprised oh except, except Holly Holm. And, and here's the reason I bring that up. First, because... I think the enormity of the upset is very similar. And two, because there's a rematch. In a rematch, what happened? Um, Holmes yeah. won again. And I yeah. think that's going to happen again. I believe that uh, Pena uh, will win the rematch. So that's the answer to your question to me, I believe. And my question to you, um, at the time when my when my beautiful grandson stole the show uh, from Papa here and, and came in, uh, I was asking... Is that Nate Diaz, Shamaya fight? Is that? I thought I saw July 29th, but maybe I'm wrong because was I wrong? I believe yeah, September oh. 10th, uh -huh. September 10th in uh, Las Vegas, T-Mobile Arena, Shamaya Diaz headlining. I wonder what uh, I was seeing. My my uh, I 
my eyes, gee, I am getting old. My eyes are starting to betray me. I saw July 29th for some kind of headline fight, but maybe I, I just was wrong. The ad was a bit confusing because it's actually um, ticket sales. Oh, uh, gotcha. that's, see, I thought they were giving me an early birthday present because that happens to be my birthday. <laughs> oh, you beat me to it. I yeah. was just going to say yeah. happy birthday yeah, in so. advance. Can't believe you're going to be 55 years old. You look great. Yeah, Lean, thank mean, you. fighting machine. Thank you. Uh, that's why you're my man here. That's why you got that seat. <laughs> you you ain't no you dummy. Look great. You ain't no dummy. <laughs> you're not just a great runner. You're pretty smart too. <laughs> you're not just handsome. And, you got brains. And, <laughs> and by the way, on that card also is friend of the show Anthony Lionheart Smith is on that uh, card coming up Saturday. He's definitely a fan favorite. We've had him, him as a guest on here with Chell Sonnen. Yeah, uh, I love him both. Good luck to Anthony. We love him as a fighter. Good person as yeah, well. Great person. Uh, him and Chell. Yeah, very good. That's the kind of the theme with most of these guys. You know, there's only a handful of like maniacs. But uh, yeah, good luck to Anthony Smith. I'm looking forward to seeing him in action again. And uh, relatively quiet on the boxing front, Teddy. I think we got one fight next week, and that is not much heralded, but it is what it is. Um, Give me one second. Oh, Danny Garcia back in action against Jose Benavidez Jr. He's from the uh, Barkley Center. Danny Garcia loves that Barkley Center. And Adam Kowanaki, another Brooklyn native by way of uh, Poland in action against, honestly, someone I've never even heard of. But, uh, yeah, curious to see how Danny, ben Danny Garcia looks. He's got all the money in the world now. He loves his Ferraris and, and Lamborghinis, I should say. So I'll be curious to see how he fights after the layoff. I think he's going to get out hustled. I, I like him. I like Danny. He's a really good, solid fighter, good counter puncher, uh, good left hook. But uh, the one weakness of his, he can be out hustled. He can be out worked. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think he maybe gets out worked, unless he hurts Benavides somewhere, which is always possible, body or head. But but other than that, I think a little bit like with the Porter fight. I thought Danny Garcia beat Sean Porter. Uh, uh, and yeah. I like both those guys. But I thought he beat him uh, technically really close. But I thought he won. But he got out of hustled and the judges saw it that way, you know, where Porter just out hustled him a little bit and 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 maybe gave the illusion he was doing more um because yeah. i again i thought that garcia was the guy who landed the cleaner punches which is what is supposed to be the criterion for scoring but it doesn't always go that way but at the end of the day if i handicap that fight quick for the people out there i kind of see this one the same way where I, I could see Garcia. Uh, I like Garcia a lot, but maybe, maybe getting out worked. Maybe. If he, unless he hurts, unless he catches Benavides and hurts him. Yeah. Well, that's it. Kind of a slow weekend for boxing, but that UFC card should be excellent. And obviously, we'll and be I back hope here somebody next told Kornacki how to move his head. I'm sure that he. <laughs> I would hope so. Really, I'm. I'm sure that he's probably got the right guy in front of him. You know, as we say in the business, uh, they probably brought his own music. Um, you know, to to maybe come back with, um, whatever. But um, I, I, the guy needs to learn uh, something about the word defense. Yeah, for sure. Well. Teddy, with that, we covered a lot, but before we sign off, I just want to say, give a quick plug to, um, if, if you guys like hearing the show and you'd like to hear more about Teddy's backstory, please check out his audiobook available on Audible. It's called uh, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Journey to Become a Man, The Teddy Atlas Story. You can find it on audible.com. It's obviously available in paperback as well. Check out Teddy's clothing collection at boxraw.com. Check out the 36, 36 collection. For, for those who don't know, 36 minutes to make life fair is the theme that all fighters should live by you get in that ring you got 36 minutes to level the playing field regardless of where you came from what your back background is 36 minutes to make life fair the box rock collection is awesome and if you want to learn some of the basic boxing techniques like the peekaboo style the 11 different types of jabs you can throw Please check out Dynamic Striking, dynamicstriking.com. Look for the Teddy Atlas instructional videos, and you can learn from the master. And uh, once you hone your skills, get in there and try it with someone punching back and see how you do. With that being said, Teddy, <laughs> great seeing you again. It was good seeing you last week. Um, that's all I got. If anyone who's watching, please, please 
take a second, click that subscribe button on YouTube. It really helps us. And support the people that supports the show that, that support the show, Athletic Greens and Feel Good Today's sponsors. Thanks for being with us, guys. And uh, with that, we'll see you Monday to break down all the action in the UFC. Have a great week, everyone.